certainly wasn't the fastest or the best looking aircraft that fought in World War II. It wasn't the easiest plane to fly, but the PBY Catalina flying boat became one of the most reliable and most admired aircraft ever built. It was a good airplane. Low altitude, rough weather. She was a tough little beast. In action, this simple, rugged and versatile aircraft proved to be the ideal workhorse around the globe. Able to operate on land and sea, the Catalina delivered supplies, flew long-range patrols and saved the lives of countless shipwrecked sailors and airmen. That airplane did everything it was asked to do and more. But it also had a darker and more menacing side to its character. In the Atlantic Ocean, Catalina's bombed and sank dozens of German submarines. In the Pacific, black-painted cats flying at night pounced on unsuspecting Japanese ships. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations joins the crew of a long-range Catalina as they patrol the dark waters of the ocean and hunt down the enemy. In 1907, a young motorcycle manufacturer from Hammondsport, New York, became fascinated with the adventure of flight. His name was Glenn H. Curtis and he would become immortalized as the creator of a very special kind of aircraft. Curtis was a born inventor. After numerous experiments, he designed an aircraft that could take off and land on water, the flying boat. Soon the military began to take an interest. During World War I, flying boats were widely used as spotter planes, mostly searching for submarines. It was the birth of a new era in naval warfare. In the First World War, the U.S. Navy really didn't have a land plane capability, so the backbone of U.S. Navy operations was the flying boat. And during World War I, they developed the NC flying boat, which was designed to be a long-range aircraft capable of flying great distances across the Atlantic, which, in fact, one of them did in May of 1919. After the war, hundreds of surplus warplanes were sold off at bargain prices, helping to fuel the passion for aviation that now gripped America. The flying boat's ability to operate from any stretch of calm water gave it an almost unlimited freedom, opening up new frontiers to aviation. When Pan American introduced its luxury clipper services to Central and South America, the golden age of the flying boat had arrived. Like the great ocean liners, the Pan Am clippers of the 1930s allowed the rich to travel in style to exotic destinations. But the Navy also saw a tactical role for large, long-range aircraft patrolling the world's oceans to give early warning of any threat to American interests. Soon the flying boat became a key part of the nation's defense planning. The main advantages of the flying boat over a wheeled aircraft, uh, certainly in the early stages before the advent of the aircraft carrier, was the great range that they had. Plus they could land almost anywhere. So they could uh, set down in any number of forward bases and so that's what made the flying boat a real advantageous platform for Navy operations, particularly in the Pacific, where the Navy was definitely looking towards fighting the next war. In 1933, the Navy invited bids for a new long-range patrol aircraft. The Consolidated Aircraft Corporation had already designed flying boats for the Navy and was determined to secure this important contract. Their chief designer was a talented engineer called Isaac Macklin Ladden known to all as Mack. In the early 1930s, most aircraft were still biplanes with fabric-covered wings braced by a maze of steel wires. In a bold move, Mack Ladden created a metal monoplane. Its huge wing was supported on a single pylon above the fuselage, braced to the hull by only four struts, two on each side. 
All flying boats needed outrigger floats for stability on water, but in the air they became a liability, increasing drag and reducing performance. Mac Ladden hit on the brilliant solution of designing floats that folded up in flight to form the wingtips, reducing the drag while adding lift. The Navy was suitably impressed and in June 1935 consolidated won a contract for 60 aircraft, the biggest military order since World War I. The plane that now came off the production line would become a classic. It was known by its code letters PBY, P for patrol, B for bomber and Y the prefix for consolidated. The PBY was a big aircraft and it certainly looked impressive. And here were all those great big beautiful PBYs. It was love at first sight and I uh, said well I've got to fly those. Along came a PBY and it was gracefully soaring above us and it was so beautiful and my mind was like a soaring eagle. It just soared and made slow turns and later on I found out that what a devil it could be in combat. PBY, the Navy called her. Back in 1935, the first PBYs took to the water and the air. Commonplace today, but then a milestone in the history of aviation. But the PBY would be best known as the Catalina, or simply the Cat. With a cruising speed of little more than 130 miles per hour, the big, twin-engine Catalina was not exactly fast, but it had tremendous endurance, with a range of well over 3,000 miles, and it could stay in the air for over 15 hours. Although it was always vulnerable to attack, its main armament was substantial. It consisted of two heavy-caliber machine guns mounted in blisters on each side of the rear fuselage. Although it had originally been designed as a patrol aircraft, the PBY could carry four 1,000-pound bombs, or two torpedoes, which greatly increased its tactical value to the Navy. The PBY did everything it was asked to do, and more. It covered a lot of ground, and it could remain aloft for a great deal of time. Basically, though, it was designed to spot the enemy fleet. Radar was just in its infancy then, and nothing could beat a pair of two human eyes in spotting the fleet and reporting it back to the home base. By the late 1930s, the world was becoming a dangerous place. In the Pacific, Japan was steadily becoming more powerful and more aggressive. In Europe, Hitler's Germany was openly rearming for war and building a navy which threatened to dominate the Atlantic. Britain and America watched and waited as tensions steadily mounted. Both nations realized that airborne early warning would play a vital role in future conflicts. Most admirals still put their faith in big gun warships, but a few believed that if war should come, it would be decided by air power. They would soon discover just how right they were. September 1939, Europe is plunged into war. Britain's first line of defense was the Royal Navy. Many of its warships carried seaplanes, which could be launched by catapult to scout beyond the horizon. The problem was getting them back. The open sea is a dangerous place to land an aircraft. Multi-engine, long-range patrol planes were a much safer bet, but Britain's hard-pressed RAF simply didn't have enough of them. In 1940, they ordered a fleet of PBYs to help patrol the Atlantic. It was the RAF pilots who coined the name Catalina. They liked the aircraft and soon discovered that the B in PBY really did mean bomber.
they began using their Catalinas to attack German U-boats. Since the start of the war, the Nazi wolf packs had roamed across the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean, sending scores of British ships to the bottom. The Catalina became a key weapon in the battle against the U-boats, locating and sinking them in increasing numbers. But Germany's powerful fleet of surface warships remained a potent threat. In May 1941, the CAT helped to secure a major British victory at sea. The Royal Navy was in hot pursuit of the German battleship, the Bismarck. At 42,000 tons, she was the pride of the Nazi battle fleet and Hitler's favorite warship. In an engagement west of Iceland, the Bismarck had sunk the British battleship HMS Hood with a direct hit. Only three of her crew survived. The Bismarck then escaped into the fog and vanished. Somewhere under that mystery of fog, the Bismarck was steaming under forced draft for a safe haven. Then a rift in the clouds, a telltale wake, a Catalina flashed the word, quarry sighted. It was a Catalina patrol plane of the RAF's Coastal Command which finally hunted down the Bismarck. Her position was reported and Britain's Royal Navy closed in for the kill. The Bismarck went down with only 115 out of the 2,400 men on board surviving. Britain had maintained her supremacy in the North Atlantic with the help of a plane designed to maintain United States supremacy in the Pacific. The attack on the Bismarck clearly demonstrated the value of a long-range patrol aircraft in combat. The U.S. was quick to learn the lessons. The long-range Catalina was the ideal aircraft for patrolling the ocean, but getting it in and out of the water meant fitting cumbersome beaching gear. It was a slow and tedious process. To solve the problem, the PBY-5A was introduced, A standing for amphibian. With a retractable undercarriage, this version of the cat was equally at home on land or at sea. Catalinas were soon stationed in U.S. bases across the Pacific, from Midway to the Philippines, and from Wake Island to Pearl Harbor. As Japan became increasingly hostile, the Navy stepped up its daily reconnaissance flights. On a peaceful Sunday morning in December 1941, the Japanese finally launched their attack on the Pacific battle fleet moored at Pearl Harbor. So I see them coming around one by one. They, they strafe and bomb, and then they make a circle and come around again. They must have made that three or four passes on each attack. You couldn't believe it, and you didn't think it was happening. The whole sky was black with smoke. Everything was on fire, and it was dead people on the dock. And uh, the oil was three feet thick on the water, and people were going around. It was utter confusion. The Japanese had not only crippled the American Pacific Fleet, they had almost wiped out the airborne patrol force. Sixty-seven Catalinas were badly damaged or completely destroyed. They picked a beautiful time. Everybody was saluting the flag. <laughs> and uh, they weren't saluting their guns. Pearl Harbor was a bitter lesson for the Americans. 
Despite all their long-range patrols, U.S. forces had failed to detect the approach of the Japanese armada. As America recovered from the shock of the Japanese attack, recruiting offices across the nation were besieged by young volunteers eager to get into the fight. I was very highly agitated at what happened out at Pearl Harbor. We weren't told too much about what happened other than it was a big blow to the fleet. And I joined the Navy the next day thinking that I got to go. <laughs> December 8th, 1941 the day after Pearl Harbor. My father was going to be the big stopper in my mind. When I came home that afternoon, and he said, how is school? I gave him the papers that I needed to get his signature on. And he thought for a long time. And he said, well, I'm too old to go, and we're going to be at war. And he said, you go. And he signed. With tears in his eyes. <laughs> the smoke from the blazing wrecks at Pearl Harbor hung in the air for days. But America was now at war, and the Catalina crews, struggling to recover from this devastating blow, would be right in the front line. The feel at that time was we've got to do something, and we've got to do it fast. Early in 1942, new Catalinas begin coming off the production lines to replace the losses at Pearl Harbor. As fresh orders pour into the consolidated factory, the call goes out for more and more workers in the race to speed up production. I would put on my application that I'd worked with some radios, and uh, of course the interviewer had a drawer that he opened up and he said, what's that? I said, it's a soldering iron. What's that? That's a wire cutter. You're an electrician. <laughs> so I became an electrician, and that was when the company was building from very few people, just hiring all the time. And there at Consolidated, we were working 11 hours a day and seven days a week. The cat soon won the respect and admiration of its crews. The standard PBY crew consisted of eight men, a bombardier who doubled as the bow gunner, a pilot and co-pilot, a navigator, a radio operator, a flight engineer, and two waste gunners. Bulkheads divided the plane into seven watertight sections. For crew comfort on long-haul patrol flights, the central compartment contained bunks and a galley. It took a lot of training to master the highly specialized art of flying a boat. Well, if you ever saw a, what I call a PBY driver, he had thick wrists and big muscles. The controls were as big as barn doors and it took a little bit of muscle to move them. It was unstable. She'd fall off on one wing or the course would wander unless you, you had to fly it every minute of the time. It had the small stabilizing tabs which you had to constantly readjust. Every time somebody moved or the load shifted just a little bit, you had to readjust it. You couldn't relax very long in that airplane, not if you were flying it. The real trick on, on a seaplane landing at any time is to make sure you keep your wings level. You do not want to get a float into the water at high speed because it'll turn you around so fast it'll be a wreck. When you come into land, why well, it's a high angle, and then boom, down you come, and it really hits hard, you know. You, you haven't got no control all of a sudden. Well, you, you put it into a, just about a stall just when you about get to the water, just splat, you come down pretty hard. It landed with a great big splash. Not a touchdown, it was a beautiful landing. But if you didn't keep coming back all the time until you got that big fat duck plowing through the water, then she'd go off the water because there weren't any flaps, anything to kill the speed. That's the one thing about that thing that 
I consider pretty vicious. The PBY certainly had its faults, but it also had great strengths. And as the crews learned to handle it, they developed a growing respect for this rugged workhorse. It was a good airplane, very good. Low altitude, rough weather, rain squalls, and uh, she was a tough little beast. Like some great seabird, the Catalina soared above the ocean on its long and lonely patrols. Its crew spent many hours out of sight of land, scanning the ocean for the tiny speck that could be a submarine periscope or a downed pilot drifting in a life raft. Keeping the engines running hour after hour was the job of the flight engineer. From his cramped compartment inside the wing support, he communicated with the pilot using a series of indicator lights. The only thing the pilot has regarding the engines in the cockpit are the throttles. Everything else is back there in a tower. He relies on his engineer. It was the navigator's job to plot their course and guide the ship home safely. It's nice to know where you are. Every once in a while a crew member that wasn't doing anything would come up and look over your shoulder and said, where are we? Well, you put your finger, you know, right there. But uh, they did trust you, no doubt about it. But sometime you're going to be lost. You won't know where you are. So what do you do? You turn around and go back and you don't know where to go back to? Uh, do you, th you think, well, my sense tells me that land is over there and water is over here, and what do you do? In bad weather, it could be an almost impossible task. Many lone Catalinas vanished without trace in the vast expanse of the Pacific. The radio operator was the only link to the outside world. His signals, tapped out in Morse code, would relay the vital early warning of enemy activity back to base. Soon the Catalina crews would play a key role in the epic sea battle that would change the entire course of the war in the Pacific. Midway. Midway Island. Not much land right enough, but it's our outpost. A Navy patrol plane. Routine patrol. Only behind every cloud may be an enemy. Following the disaster of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese continued to drive back American forces in the Pacific. In June 1942, the Imperial Japanese Navy sent a huge task force to capture the American-held Midway Island, 1,100 miles northwest of Pearl Harbor. The first objective was to lure the remaining ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet into battle and sink them. But the Japanese codes had been broken and the defenders knew an attack was coming. What they didn't know was the exact position of the task force. Up until the Battle of Midway, the U.S. Navy, quite frankly, was not having a good war. They had only been able to score some hit-and-run raids against Japanese islands. So the Battle of Midway was very much a showdown in which the U.S. Navy was going to put it all on the line to stop the Japanese fleet. On the morning of June the 3rd, a Catalina patrol aircraft spotted the leading ships of the Japanese task force. At dawn the following morning, another Catalina finally spotted the remaining ships, including the aircraft carriers. A large force of American carrier planes took off to strike the Japanese battle fleet. But the waves of dive bombers were met by superior Japanese fighters and suffered appalling losses. Then, in ten short minutes, the tide turned completely. American dive bombers caught three Japanese aircraft carriers 
whilst their decks were packed with aircraft, rearming and refueling. With no air cover, the big carriers were sitting ducks, and all three quickly fell victim to American attacks. Later that day, a fourth Japanese aircraft carrier was lost. Midway was a devastating defeat for the Japanese and marked the turning point in the Pacific War at sea. At last, US forces had won a decisive victory as the Japanese found themselves on the defensive for the first time. In the Battle of Midway, there were some elements that played a great role, and certainly that was finding where the Japanese fleet was. And code breaking played a role in that, but it still required an aircraft to spot the ships. And it was here that the PBY played a pivotal role in the battle, because it was PBYs that spotted not only the invasion force destined for Midway, but more importantly, uh, spotted the carrier force. The Catalina had proved its ability beyond any doubt, but even before Pearl Harbor, in an ongoing quest for bigger and better, the Navy had already ordered its intended replacement. The battleship of the air, the Coronado, the mightiest seaborne aircraft now in service. The four-engined Coronado was a far bigger and more modern aircraft, but it cost three times as much as the Catalina to build and was a very complex machine. By contrast, the CAT was easy to produce in large numbers, and so remained the standard workhorse of the Navy. Like Henry Ford's Model T, it was slow but sure, and it got the job done. But every Catalina crewman knew that even with its armament, the slow-moving CAT stood very little chance of surviving a Japanese fighter attack. Those long and lonely ocean patrols would be some of the most dangerous missions of the whole Pacific War. The Catalina has been called the cruiser of the air. Her wing spread is 105 feet. Her length from nose to tail is 65 feet. She can carry a load of many tons. Her range, fully loaded, is over 4,000 miles, and the PBYs, new and old, have stood up to all the tasks imposed by modern war. But sometimes the odds against it were just too great. On his first combat patrol in August 1942, Bob Dimmitt's Catalina was attacked out of the blue by three Japanese fighters. They were real show-offs. They would corkscrew in and roll. I, I, I watched one of them uh, coming in on our tail there, and uh, he, was, he was just lazily doing rolls and shooting at us. I guess they figured that this was a big duck and it was going. Our radioman was, was killed. He was sitting right behind me. But the mechanic was shot through the chest and uh, those were the two big casualties that we had. The rest of us all had small shrapnel in us. Then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the Japanese Zeros vanished. One man was dead, one seriously wounded, and the cat was badly damaged. And when we got away from there, our port engine was starting to burn. But uh, that sucker flew and uh, we noticed some dots on the horizon. Never saw such pretty pieces of palm trees in our life. Somehow they managed to crash land the damaged Catalina in shallow water and skidded to a halt on the beach. When we stopped, then we started getting kind of worried because we really didn't know at that time where we were and whether it was friendly or enemy. So we climbed out of the airplane and stood there with, <laughs> with our big 45s in our hands and... Uh, Waited. After a week marooned on their tropical island, Bob Dimmitt and his crew were beginning to wonder how long they could survive before help came, or the Japanese arrived. All of a sudden we see this dot just off the water underneath this black cloud heading right for us, and it looked like a, a seaplane. 
Well, at that time, we didn't know whether it was a Japanese seaplane or whether it was an American seaplane, so we didn't do anything. And we waited and waited and waited until the last minute, and then we could finally make out that it was a Catalina. And we were jumping up and down and uh, yelling at him, but Santa Claus has nothing on, on that airplane. The relief that you feel when you have a friend that just flies by like that there is, well, it's, you can't describe it. We know then that uh, we're home free. All but one of Bob's crew survived their ordeal, thanks to the Catalina. Such narrow escapes had a profound effect. Hey, I got news for you. They were all brothers under the skin, boy, after that one there, and it, there was no doubt about that. We stayed close for a long time. Yeah. Usually bonding shows up after an incident or an accident. If the pilot manages to evade and get the plane back without being shot down, he is the biggest thing in the world to that crew. So now they've bonded to the pilot and the crew has bonded together as one. You could see it happen, and, and when I was on the islands in the South Pacific and the PBYs would come back from their patrol, you could tell that there's a change over them. All of a sudden, they're like brothers. You can't come between them. Not surprisingly, every American GI in the Pacific learned to love the cat. Its familiar and friendly outline in the sky was always a welcome sight. For the troops isolated on remote coral islands, it meant news from home in the mail. For the wounded, it meant vital medical supplies and a trip to the safety of a base hospital. For survivors, drifting for days in the empty ocean, it meant life itself. And for the men who flew it, the cat became one of the family. Oh yes, every hop we came back on, that the airplane was our baby. We loved it. We put it to bed at night, wake it up in the morning, and if we had any long flights, it never occurred to us that anything was going to go wrong. The cats operated in the most primitive conditions, and their crews learned to become almost entirely self-sufficient. You had to be self-sufficient. And those planes were on their own. They'd be at some out-of-the-way island in a cove, and there'd be some 55-gallon drums of fuel and some oil. You lived in the plane, and you ate, cooked, and lived in the plane. On land or on water, the big cats were most vulnerable to Japanese air attacks between missions. But many of their forward bases were hacked out of the jungle and not easily spotted from the air. Their long-haul missions across the Pacific put a huge strain on the aircraft and on the dedicated ground crews who kept them flying with only the most basic equipment. Preventative maintenance is the secret to the whole thing. The old saying goes, you can't pull off the road and call for a wrecker. If you have a problem and you lose an engine, you're going to have to return to base. You have a full crew, full ammo, full gas load, Perish the thought that you lose an engine on takeoff. The remote jungle bases had no workshop facilities, but this didn't stop the Catalina. It carried its own set of folding work platforms, which could be hung on the engines. There you were. You were on a platform. You could work in the whole accessory section. After a set number of hours in the air, each engine had to be thoroughly inspected. Each check would be more intense. And you had to see him coming because that meant that it was going to be work. Not just flying, it was going to be work. You had to get yourself 30. And then you would have the 30, 60, 90, and 120 hour check. Right now 120 hour takes quite a long time. That's 120 hours in the air. Now the airplane's going to be down for a couple of days. In wartime, that's not really well thought of. But it has to happen. So you can imagine that there's a lot of fellas, a lot of mechanics, really running all over that airplane to get it back in the air. 
That's one thing a pilot doesn't want is to have his airplane on the deck. It's not what it's built for. A close bond developed between the pilot and his chief engineer. Lives depended on both their skills. Before each mission, they would thoroughly check out the aircraft together. Uh, it's the rapport that you develop with the pilot. And if you're the chief aboard, or if you're the senior man aboard, or if you're the flight engineer, you're a little bit closer to the pilot than the rest of the crew. He'll come to you first. But he's still in charge. I realized I was the man behind the wrench. I wasn't the man up front driving. The pilot drives it. I fix it. It's an airplane that you could fix with duct tape or something like that. If it had been too complicated, it wouldn't have been able to do the job. But this faithful servant could also show another, much more aggressive side to its nature. When darkness fell, the docile cat would transform into a deadly hunter. Guadalcanal is the most hotly contested strip of land in the South Pacific. For five months, the Japs have tried to win back this vital outpost. But their transports, bombed and beached, lie wrecked on the sands of the Solomon Islands. Midway had marked the turning point at sea, but it was Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands which finally halted the Japanese advance on land. It was a critical situation as the Japanese poured men and supplies into battle in a desperate bid to drive American forces back into the sea. The entire Japanese operation depended on regular supply runs by a fleet of transport ships operating at night and supported by destroyers and light cruisers known as the Tokyo Express. The only hope of an American victory lay in cutting off this lifeline of supplies. It was finally achieved with the help of a most unlikely weapon. Anything familiar? That torso with a middle-aged sag? Her speed less than some cars can do. Got her? Right. The old cat. Navy Catalina patrol boat. PBY in a black nightgown for night camouflage. A black cat. It was called the black cat because they flew at night and the plane was painted perfectly black. Despite its age, the Catalina was pioneering a new kind of clandestine operation, which would become an increasingly important part of modern warfare. During the day, to launch a PBY on any sort of attack mission would have been suicide because it was a slow and lumbering aircraft. But uh, those attributes made it really particularly suited to night combat, where it could loiter over targets and, and search for them really at, at will. For every pound of bombs dropped last month, one ton of enemy shipping was sunk or damaged. Records like that mean plenty in any language, dollars or yen. The formula was very simple, but very effective. Take a regular PBY Catalina patrol plane, paint it matte black from nose to tail, hide its glowing exhaust pipes above the wings, and turn off all navigation lights. Then hang 4,000 pounds of bombs under its wings and you have a very potent weapon. The Black Cat, the original stealth bomber. Another night, another mission, another prowl into the dark. A cat needs its nine lives on these jobs. Back at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese surprise attack had decimated the Catalina force. Now, under cover of darkness, the cats took their revenge. This time, it would be the Japanese who were caught napping. These long-haul missions were always tense and exhausting for the Catalina crews. The skipper always had us doing things. And he'd say, you guys in the blisters, I want you to keep an eye out. And if he ever saw anything, and we didn't see it first, we was in bad trouble. <laughs> we, had, we reported seeing something before he did, or he'd said, all right, what's going on back there? Do you guys sound asleep? Without radar, the Japanese forces were unable to locate the cats in the darkness. 
Even powerful searchlights usually failed to reveal the cat's presence, and the defenders could only fire blindly into the night sky in hope of hitting something. The searchlight would be right on us, and nobody shot at us. The searchlight come right on, and everything gets light, all light up in the in the in the in the plane. Said, "Oh, oh, just kept. We just kept right on going, and the light went off somewhere else. So they never did see us. Never would see us." The attack had to be made on the first pass to gain the advantage of surprise. But the slow flying cat had plenty of time to line up on the target. You know, we, we dropped bombs. We dropped everything we had, and I don't know because we never did. Nobody ever went down to see what had happened because that was that was Japanese territory. One more flight completed. One less convoy flying the rising sun. Another loss in losses adding up to billions of dollars in equipment that didn't get there. In one month alone, a single squadron claimed 43 Japanese ships as the black cats stalked the night skies. Most of their victims never knew what hit them. Starved of their vital supplies, the Japanese lost their grip on the Solomon's chain. And began the long and bloody retreat back across the Pacific to the home islands. At a critical moment in history, the Black Cat squadrons, hunting and bombing by night, had helped to turn the tide of the war in the Pacific. A job done by planes that can't maneuver but do. That can't dive, that can't rev up speed to wiggle out of a run, but go in anyway for a second try, a third, and every less ship gives the men who are landing a better break. That's what keeps the cats flying. When production ended, nearly 4,000 Catalinas had been built, making it by far the most numerous flying boat ever designed. In a variety of services uh, with a variety of nations, the PBY did everything in almost every theater of war. It dropped bombs, it dropped torpedoes, it depth charged U-boats, it fired retro rockets. It was the Dumbo for down flyers, uh, the, the salvation and savior for them when they're floating in the open ocean with little chance of rescue without the PBY. So in short, the PBY performed all missions that it was called upon to do and performed them with uh, great ability. After the war, most military aircraft were scrapped, but the cats soldiered on. They were simply too useful to throw away. Wherever there was water, the Catalina still had a peacetime job to do: coast guard patrols, firefighting, cargo carrying, passenger carrying, exploration, surveying, and a score of other roles. The coming of the jet age hastened the death of most remaining flying boats, but not the cats. As the new millennium dawns, the consolidated PBY Catalina is still flying, one of the longest-lived and best-loved aircraft of all time. That airplane, I fell in love with it. All I could say was, Mr. Consolidated, you did a hell of a job.